Hi, I'm Carol Baskin, and this is Cat Chat with Patty Finch, one of my favorite people. <laughs> and we were discussing before getting the cameras all set up here, you know, what would be interesting for people to know? And I think people would really love to know how you first became interested in animals. Was this like, you know, from the time you were a child? Um, yes, definitely. I was always into the family dog. And we also had a parakeet with a very large vocabulary. My, my family was a humane family. The only time I saw my father cry until he died at age 90 was when that parakeet died. Wow. It meant so much to him. And when there was a rattlesnake in the yard, he caught it in a garbage can with a rake. And then we took the rattlesnake out to the desert. So it was really modeled for me. And you had said earlier today that we're currently in North Carolina, at, or South Carolina, where are we? We're in North Carolina. <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> at a workshop that is being co-sponsored by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and IPAW. And you had said then that you had come back to the desert. So I'm assuming you were born in the desert? Yes, yes. Um, I grew up in, well, I was born in Michigan, but at a age one or two, one, I think, we came out to Arizona. And so I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Yeah. The parakeet that you had, I learned through you how long these birds live. And so you said he already had a huge vocabulary. Was that, had, did he come to you as an adult and already had this vocabulary? No. He, <laughs> he learned it at home. And he was hanging in a little cage, which makes me cringe now. Um, but we let him out. And um, so he did, he did have flight, and there was a television in the kitchen also, and he knew the theme music to different, song, uh, different shows, so he would say, I love Lucy, when he'd hear the music coming oh my out. Gosh. And he knew all of our names, and um, so he was very, very special. After he died, I remember we buried him in a matchbox in the garden, but my parents went out and got a new parakeet. And when they brought it home, they forgot this was a bird that wasn't acclimated to our house. And it flew right into the living room window and died. Oh, no. Which was, oh, that very, was so traumatic for it a It was child. very traumatic. But that lesson has stuck with me. That's one reason that, you know, parrots, parakeets aren't that appropriate as pets. Most of us can bring a dog or a cat home in the first few minutes. We're not going to kill it. But that's easy to happen with a bird because there's so many uh, hazards we don't think about, like the ceiling fan mm. or the mirrors or the window. And, and it is easy to, to quickly kill one. And plus, you know, they are the most free of animals, them and fish, I guess, because they can move horizontally, vertically. And both fish and birds, we put them in the smallest containers in our home. It's almost as if we're jealous. So I'm very passionate about birds of all types belonging in the wild. They're all somebody's native wildlife, like our robin. You know, the parakeets belong in their native habitat. And um, uh, I... I think the ones that are in captivity and obviously have to stay in captivity should at least have the ability and space to fly. I have about 60 rescue birds <laughs> at my house and they um, are on our property and they all are in aviaries and living in flocks. And But still, you know, they should be flying um, across the rainbow. I think one of the saddest songs for me to listen to is Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Bluebirds Fly, Birds Fly Over the Rainbow, Why, Oh, Why Can't I? Oh, gosh. I and never thought about that from the perspective of a bird. bird. <laughs> you know, I usually hear dog and cat rescue groups <laughs> right? <using> that song. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So I'm pretty passionate about birds. <laughs> Maybe with a name like Finch, I was destined. <laughs> you see that so frequently where people, I'm reading a book right now by a woman named Paula Wilde, and she wrote about wild cougars, and it was like, is that really her <laughs> <Right>. name? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and when I first found out that you had this passion for birds, it was like, I wonder if she changed Change her name. name to Finch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was no, always no. Finch. Uh, and, but I always had a real affinity for animals, and uh, animals seemed to have an affinity for me, too, because there was a neighbor with a German Shepherd, and when I would walk to the bus, as we did back then, the, the dog would jump the fence and walk with me to the bus. He was not our dog, he was a neighbor's dog. And when I'd get off the bus, he was sitting there waiting for me, would walk me home, and then he'd go jump back in his yard. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> you know, I, I tend to believe that we come back over and over again and that we reestablish relationships with those that we have loved in, in previous lives. And so, you know, from my perspective, it's like, oh, it's so <laughs> soulmate. <laughs> they have to come back. It's like, I have to protect you. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, my gosh. When I was, um, I had to be like four or five years old because I wasn't in school yet, I had a canary that lived in my bedroom. Oh, beautiful beautiful songs I remember that canary singing but cleaning the cage was the dirtiest task I could ever remember was trying to take care of this bird and my way of dealing with that was just to strip down bare naked take the you know turn the bird <laughs> loose in my bedroom take the cage outside and hose it down with the hose and I remember my mother coming out there horrified she's like you cannot clean the bird cage naked in the front yard <laughs> in our neighborhood <laughs> and it just made perfect oh, sense to me yes I'm sure it did that I, I actually put on a respirator um, high quality mask to clean the aviaries even though I wet everything down so that the birds are not getting you know dust um, from their droppings because in nature they they have their droppings and they go off somewhere else that and um, it's not good for them to breathe it in it's not good for us to breathe it in and um, I could feel my lungs tightening up, so I started mm -hmm. wearing the respirator, which has helped a great deal. We have air filters in there. But it's just another sign that birds aren't meant to be in captivity. Um, and it is a huge job uh, cleaning for them. And you're in rescue work, so you know this feeling that even though you enjoy the animals that you're taking care of, and there's moments of, of real joy and laughter with them, there's also this feeling of now the woman who was abusing these birds and it was sort of a bird mill because there are bird mills just like there are puppy mills mm. and the conditions they're in are horrendous and so these birds came from a very bad situation but I bet if anything she just got a slap on her wrist and sometimes I feel like I'm living the life sentence for what she did because every weekend I'm spending most of my time that I can spare from work cleaning. Um, that's my free time activity is cleaning the aviaries. And I change the water each day. My husband gets up real early, chops vegetables. Um, and he also does that every afternoon. We give them great food. Um, and we give them enrichment, things, we have popcorn parties for them, we do <laughs> all kinds of things, but it's an expense, it's a real obligation, um, it's hard to find someone to come in and take care of those birds if we wanted to go somewhere, so, you know, the, the typical I've never thing. met your husband, <laughs> you guys can't travel together. That's right, that's right. <laughs> And, um, you know, that if we were a nonprofit, I would say, you've got to get out of founder stage and get some help <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. But we're just doing it as individuals. And it's also had this impact on our, um, our future planning. You know, we, we can't travel together because it's hard to get somebody in to, to take care of that many birds. And, you know, we're not a nonprofit, and I don't want at this age to be starting a nonprofit and, you know, all that energy that that takes and managing volunteers and employees. But it has impacted what we're going to do with our house when we die, etc. You know, we have to have a trust now that goes to the birds. 
whereas before I was looking forward to I'll give this much to this nonprofit, this much to that nonprofit. You know, the executor can sell the property that we're on because um, that's where most of our, our money is, is in that property. And, and now we don't have any choice. It's got to go for the care of those birds. If you want to give even two uh, parakeets, <laughs> parakeets actually can integrate into a flock pretty good, except Quakers are a type of parakeet. And once they're in a flock, they really don't like new birds. Mm. So you can have a Quaker aviary, but you can't just, as a nonprofit, take in another Quaker and throw it in there. You got to build a new aviary and introduce other Quakers into that aviary. So for some uh, sanctuary to take our birds, they're going to be spending, well, we have them in one, two, we have them in three, three, four, <laughs> it depends, <laughs> I keep counting, uh, four aviaries. And for them to replicate that on their site, they're going to spend at least 60000 per aviary mm. um, to build it right so that it's, you know, cleanable and, and all that. And, and we spent some money converting things so that they were aviaries. Um, so it's a huge financial obligation to ask a nonprofit to take on without giving them substantial money to go with it. I don't want to be a rescue when I die. Say, oh, now somebody's got to come rescue my birds. No, we want to provide yeah, that for just them. Be too weirdly, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's never going to happen. Right. Right. We're and these survive. birds can live a long time. Yes. Yes. Um, I recently took in my last ones that I'm taking in and one is um, by the leg band on it um, I think it's 25 years old right now a Quaker. Are they all banded or no that is the only one I have that has a band mm -hmm. and it was found outside a sushi bar um, getting food <laughs> dive bombing people and getting the su sushi <laughs> and uh, yes a smart bird and uh, they are very smart, and they, um, two of them have had what I call the Helen Keller moment where they realize that words have real meaning. So, for instance, a bird will use English that they have learned from me, but use it in a new situation. Um, we were sitting in an aviary open to the air, and Elmo, he was named when I got him as a rescue, uh, Elmo, a hawk flew over the aviary. And Elmo looked up, and as the hawk went over, he said, oops. And a hawk is a very big <laughs> oops in their world. And then he said, oh, my God, after it flew past. He also had a mate, of course, we take the eggs away right away, hard boil them, put them back um, so that the, the female doesn't keep laying eggs and get calcium depleted. I just don't want to see any birds born into captivity. And they can't tell? Hmm? They can't tell? No, they, they can't. And after a while, they finally give up. But they're very devoted parents. You know, the mother keeps sitting on it and the father keeps feeding the female. But when he would mate with her, he would say like it while he was mating with her and after he finished mating he would say I love you. Hmm. So obviously only teach our better half. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not you Bowie. <laughs> no, not you Paul. Um, so um, it, it's using the words in a new situation appropriately, one that I obviously have not modeled and I had not had a hawk go by and talk about it before. So um, that tells me the bird really understands that words have meaning. And uh, a bird buddy of his has um, not that great a help. And I'll say to Elmo, is Kiwi okay? And if he is, he Elmo says, okay. And if he's not, he doesn't say anything. And then I take the bird to the vet because I know that Elmo knows better than I when that bird needs to go. Once wow. 
I shut the aviary door, and luckily there's a space like that, but I shut it on his neck, and of course, birds' necks are actually very, very skinny. So I said, Elmo, Elmo, are you okay? Are you okay? And he said, okay, accident, I love you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I was like, don't die now. I'll never <laughs> get over it. <laughs> and he was fine. Oh. Wow. So just knowing that these beings flying outside have so much intelligence and such rich lives um, and emotional lives, it just breaks your heart when you think of them being in a cage by themselves when they're flock animals. They, it, it must be horrible for them because in the wild they're never alone. And if they're away from their mate or their flock, they're calling back and forth, which is why parrots scream in the house. Um, they're just doing what comes natural to them, um, trying to stay in touch with you, which is why I love that mine are in aviaries, in flocks, and they don't need me. Elmo still talks to me all the time. He'll fly over. And, and it's a greater compliment to have a, a bird of their own free will fly over and land on you and talk to you than if they were imprisoned in a cage, you know. So it's it's actually a more enjoyable interaction. And uh, they the birds are so like us in emotions. You know, my husband would one time did something and and he said, oh, damn it, or something like that. And I said, why can't you just laugh when you trip? And he said, nobody does that. And I said, Elmo does. And he went, oh, yeah, Elmo does. <laughs> and I was like, because Elmo, if he's carrying a stick on the perch and then he trips, he'll go, ha, 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 and we go on. And so, but it was after a second, we looked at each other and said, this is a crazy conversation. <laughs> So you may notice that we're in different clothes. <laughs> it's because I planned this very badly and I'm having to grab little bits and pieces of our time. <laughs> no. So thank you for meeting me with me at stupid o'clock in the morning. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully my brain will kick in. <laughs> what I asked Patty to do, she gave an excellent presentation at this Big Cat Sanctuary Conference. As did Carol. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we're just like, everybody's best fan club. <laughs> But what I thought would really be of interest to the people who watch the show is for her to give the same presentation that she gave to everybody there about GFAS and how um, it kind of a myth buster about GFAS from what I saw from what was happening in the room. I think people really received it well. And so if you could just kind of run us through the same presentation that you gave, I think that'd be great. Okay. Um, I started with a little background on GFAS that we were formed in. 2007. Um, I was hired as the first executive director at the end of 2008. And actually, I'm going to make these slides a little bigger so that I don't forget to say something here. And hopefully, we can cut this part out. <laughs> yeah, this can all be edited. There were, I think, about 48 people in the room from sanctuaries all across the world. And I'm hoping that they'll give us a list of the sanctuaries so we can tell you who some of the best sanctuaries in America are that have big cats. OK. Yeah, we are a nonprofit form um, funded primarily by grants and a few big donors, but not many. So we um, are working on a more sustainable business plan. And GFAS is the only internationally recognized accrediting organization. On our board, we have, uh, for instance, uh, Adam Roberts is the president, and he's with Born Free as an executive vice president. Mike Markarian from HSUS uh, is our vice president. But they serve at all the board members serve as individuals uh, who care passionately about sanctuaries, and and these people do indeed. They don't represent their organizations, or we probably never get anything done because we would never they would never all agree on everything. But as individuals, they can agree, 
thought and, that was a really good point that you brought out about yeah. how they all work together despite all the differences. Yes, and they, uh, so if like Mike Markarian went off the board, we wouldn't, we don't have an HSUS position, we just have a board position and indeed when someone has gone off from the board that was with a particular facility, thus far they haven't been replaced with someone from that same facility. I'm going to put some pillows over this air conditioner oh, here, why so you we, can just go ahead. You <laughs> can turn it off um, on the wall too, it might help. Okay, um, let's see. Our staff um, is on our website and so I won't go into that too much, but um, I'll, I'll I'll just say they're very dedicated staff and we all work remotely and um, at this conference I met three of them for the first time. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two of them are interns and that I had never met and one is a, a, a consultant that works with us that we've worked together two and a half years and I wow. just met her. <laughs> So you work very leanly. You guys are not flying all around and having no, <laughs> no. And we um, use. Uh, I know you're a fan of technology. We use Asana.com, and it's free and it's a great collaborative tool. And each of our to-do lists and our projects, we group them by projects, etc., are on there. And there's no administrator, so anyone can assign a task to anyone else. So my staff <laughs> can assign things to me, um, like they want me to review something. Um, I can assign things to them and um, it, it, we just go back and forth in Asana and I, I can quickly see how many groups are waiting or working on accreditation or verification and what stage they're at. When I click on the name, all the email regarding that is there. And then we combine that with Dropbox where we keep all their documents and photos. So we found ways, thanks to Robin Mason, who is our uh, very technological savvy person, ways to work together very effectively. Um, okay, these this is GFAS by the numbers. We right now we're about to accredit uh, or verify our 150th sanctuary. Verification is a high standard, but I'll get into that in a moment. And this is like the biggest accrediting body that's ever existed because mm -hmm. I don't think any of the ones that ever came before GFAS ever had more than maybe 40. 40. Yeah, I was going to say 42. I think. Next year, sometime we'll pass AZA in <laughs> numbers, <laughs> and probably in percent of um, those in the field, mm -hmm. uh, what percent are actually getting accredited or verified? Uh, animals in need of placement. Um, at the end of 2012, we had helped place 6,582 animals. And in some cases, many cases, we were the lead organization. And for instance, uh, I called Montana Large Animal Sanctuary Rescue and Rescue. Said, I heard you're having some problems. Could you use some help if we could place some animals? And he said, yes, about a thousand. And um, your heart's got to just stop right there. It's like, <laughs> oh, a <Yeah>. thousand. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and oh, actually, we did it in about a month and a half. Um, when I would contact the national organizations, they said this is too big for us. And I thought, okay, me and Robin—that's who we had on <laughs> staff—we'll do it. Um, but they were right because under GFAS, we could get people to work together, organizations to work together, some of whom had even taken out ads against each other. We could get them to work together, deliver animals to each other, and uh, many of the national groups did contribute a lot of funding. It was a very expensive operation and also expertise and staff, <coughs> excuse me, and we um, uh, set up teams and uh, 
it, it just was an amazing process and worked with groups we'd never worked with before, like Animal Eels in Montana was a very key organization in the whole process, very key, um, true heroes. So, but everybody that worked on that rescue is still pretty traumatized by it. It was a very difficult rescue. Um, that we have given out 276,000 in grants to organizations. Um, I think that's the thing that would surprise most people mm -hmm. that are in the sanctuary field because that's never happened before. There's never been money available from the accrediting body to actually help them. Yes, and we help them with um, items that they need to become in compliance with the standards. And uh, it's unusual, I can tell you as a former funder, it's unusual for foundations to give you what they call pass-through money. In other words, trusting you to give out their money to other organizations. Um, I believe we were the first organization like that PetSmart Charities had ever done that with. They did that for the equine great grants. But there is such faith in GFAS that <clears throat> they felt we would use their <clears throat> money wisely to donate. You have a history with PetSmart. Yes, I used to work there. I, I, not surprisingly, I, my main objective in going to work there was to end the uh, bird sales, <laughs> well, uh, and they did stop, uh, not just because of me, um, stop the uh, big bird sales, but they were still selling parakeets and canaries that kind. Um, we've given out um, seventy-six thousand in expenses. We've paid for um, in uh, reimbursing sanctuaries for transportation costs, medical cost, and that figure is has gone up this year, of course. And because these are 2012, and we have helped um, sanctuaries receive more than five hundred and ninety-six thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and that's a very real number from where we took when we told a sanctuary about an opportunity or a grant that they didn't know about and they were kind enough to, to contact us and say, we got it. So there could be a lot more that you mm -hmm. don't even know about because people right. are so bad saying thank you. <laughs> right. right. So um, that's some of the numbers. We also, also give out the Carol Noon Award each year and um, one of the recipients, for instance, was Jill Robinson of Animals Asia. Um, well, all of the people that have received it have been heroes of, of mine. We accept um, uh, nominations through March of each year, or end of March each year, and they don't have to be from an accredited organization. Um, Animal Asia is not accredited, though we hope they will be. Um, Let's see, I was going to talk a little about the uh, requirements for accreditation and verification. Some things are pretty basic and we do a qualifying call to make sure we won't waste the organization's time. Um, it's no, like writing a grant. <laughs> yes, it is. And evaluating this is very, feels very comfortable to me because I evaluated grants of about, we were giving out about 10 million at PetSmart Charities at the time I was there and reviewing all those grants. So it feels, the due diligence feels very similar. Um, no commercial trade in animals. Um, <clears throat> no animals removed from the enclosures for exhibits. No direct contact between the public and animals. Um, there's obviously some exceptions for like the equine facilities um, where they're trying to adopt out the animals. Um, measures in place to prevent breeding, successful measures, <laughs> and open to the public only par as part of a structured and, and bona fide program. On the no breeding, we do make an exception, like Zuave in Costa Rica is accredited by us, and they have a breeding program for the green macaws, and they do release them to the wild. They do a soft release so the birds can come back in for the native food in the enclosed aviary, go out, and after a while they're all out. And so if you're actually releasing and it's successful in their native habitat, 
course, that is not possible with tigers in the United States. So, and I thought you made an excellent point in your presentation when you said that. Um, I forget quite how you put it, but it's like not for DNA conservation or not for right. DNA preservation. Yeah. That's just BS. <laughs> right. It. It. it <coughs> To me, that's not conservation, um, saving, you know, breeding to save DNA. Right. Because the animal <clears throat> will never be what it was. And so far, I don't see a single animal released as a result of that. But maybe there have been some. But not carnivores. <laughs> not carnivores. Um, okay. So, um, let's see here. Um, what kind of facilities do we accredit? It's not just sanctuaries. We also do rescues, and we also do rehabilitation centers, which some people don't realize, but that's very important in helping to end the exotic wildlife trade, is that there are accredited rehab centers that uh, when animals are confiscated, that there is some place for them to go. Otherwise, in some countries, you may see them being sold back to the uh, poachers. <laughs> so um, as, as one example that can happen, and also euthanasia. So uh, I think that's one of the best things we've done, is accrediting rehabilitation centers in crucial areas like Nicaragua and uh, others. I don't think that's ever been done before. No. It hasn't. It's just groundbreaking. <laughs> um, it, you know, I can't. I can't take credit for all. I've learned so much from my board members, um, and uh, Dr. Ian Robinson from IFA has been very kind in mentoring me, and he's just brilliant. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is an organization that's greatly needed. Um, one. You know, before I had this job, um, one thought in my head was sanctuaries are, you know, it's an awful high cost per animal. And then I was part of a case with some abused animals and I accidentally stumbled on them in a, in a sanctuary afterwards. And I thought, you know, these animal victims are or do special dispensation, just like human victims of oh. crimes. And so that was one thing. And then the second thing is, is law enforcement doesn't want to euthanize. And if there is not a place for the animals to go, law enforcement is very reluctant to act. So um, when I hear statements like, we can't rescue our way out of this problem, I also think it's true that we can't solve the problem without rescue because law enforcement, they're humans, they don't want to act unless there's a place for them to go. And so that's a very crucial role that sanctuaries play in enabling law enforcement. Um, the GFAS accreditation and verification program, um, we have some basic forms, you know, your address and that kind of thing, the census of animals, the clarifying questions via phone that I mentioned about no breathing, etc. Um, and then they complete a more detailed application. And really, we're like the doctor, we're looking for what's wrong, yes, but the reason is we want to fix it and help you fix it so that you have a long, healthy life. That was such a great analogy. Because <laughs> well, everybody thinks it's about policing them, and it's not. It's about helping them. Yeah, we have no authority to, to police. I mean, we, we went on one place where there was body condition scores of one with animals. I mean, of course, we're going to report that to the deputy, and we, we tell people that um, before we come, but or if you're growing a big field of marijuana or something like that, we're going to report it to the proper authorities as any law-abiding citizen would. But um, we, we are there to help sanctuaries. And it's not a pass-fail. It's uh, here's the list of things that you need to do to get verified. Verified says you have great animal care. Um, 
and we take a brief look at the finances and if there if you're on lease property we want to look at that lease and make sure it's fair to the nonprofit it gives you plenty of time at the lease or cancel to move those animals to a new location um, so it, you know it's that's what you do for verified and then for accredited there's we go more into depth on written policies and um, safety protocols and um, the governance issues, your financial reports, all those kind of things. And of course, anybody that applies, we keep that confidential that they have applied. Um, and we uh, won't release any information unless the organization gives us permission to do that. Uh, we also have ways for the public to complain about a facility that is accredited or verified on our website, and we take all those seriously. And goodness knows you guys have investigated <laughs> us enough from all of the bad guys <laughs> reporting us. <laughs> yes, and we we uh, it has to be in writing, and it can it has to be non-anonymous. But we keep that person's identity confidential, and we keep confidential the outcome of our investigation. It's it's a private matter between us and the organization unless illegalities are involved, which has not happened. <laughs> um, so and also from all the years in PetSmart charities where people would complain about a grantee was not using their funds properly. You can I feel I can pretty much tell from the way the the complaint is worded whether it's legit or not. Uh, there's just a different feel to those that are legit, but we do, <coughs> excuse me, investigate all of them. Um, we another analogy I use with accreditation is you can have the electric company come into your home, and they test everything. If there's airflow out of the the outlets, that you're losing energy that way. But their whole purpose is to save you money, and so they say, "Okay, here's here's the changes you can make um, if you want to be more, you know, lower your energy bills." What we're trying to do is make sure that we've checked um, not only animal care, but usually the usually the animal care is not the issue. We may go to some facilities that are older that have structures from 1970 that were fine then and they're still sound but they're on concrete or whatever in those instances we don't say tear them all down tomorrow um, we work with them on a plan and um, how they're gradually going to replace those or, or improve them or whatever it is they're going to do um, and also, some groups that don't have all their policies written down, we said, well, when we come back in three years, because we come back in three years, we want to see that you have a volunteer manual. But what we're looking for a lot, um, because the animal care is often fine, especially in the places that have applied thus far, um, we are looking at what could bring your sanctuary to your knees that you don't know about. Um, they, they, uh, a very fine facility that has, I know HSUS has, has praised it, I've praised it, they had no director and operators insurance and they had no general liability insurance and we're saying, you know, all it will take is one visitor here, you know, suing you, it might wipe you out. So now they're in the process of getting that insurance and you would think that's a very basic thing. Um, but if you've never had a problem, you just might never even think of it. So you guys have seen such a huge array of different types of sanctuaries and how they've run, so you've seen how some little thing can just... Yes, one, one sanctuary run by a friend of mine that has been around for a long time. I was talking to her about the criteria and I mentioned fire alarms and um, she said, Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any. <laughs> and she, I mean, it's a beautiful sanctuary, but that had just never occurred to them. So it's fresh eyes coming in, and it's more of a partnership. That's our 845 alarm. <laughs> oh, really? So you're going to have to pack up so that we can leave. Okay, well, um, 
let me just see if there's any last minute. Um, I sort of covered if they if an organization doesn't need a standard, we work with them. Um, and uh, and while you're looking through that, one of the things I know that you guys do is you reach out to all of the currently verified and accredited sanctuaries for their policies to help share with other people so that these people that are having to put policies in place for the first time don't have to write it from scratch. You're going to help them with it. That's right. And um, <laughs> the computer <laughs> shutting down. Um, that's right. And um, I would just say we, we continue to be a resource to uh, sanctuaries after they're accredited and verified. And I've had calls like, two animals died. It was our fault. The volunteers are outraged. What do I do? Mm. And we step in with good advice and connect them to, to people who can give really good advice also, maybe somebody who's been through something similar and how you deal with it. So. Yeah, one of the things from the conference here that I heard so many people saying is that they wanted like a centralized area where everybody mm -hmm. could share ideas and communicate with each other and so that all the good guys were working together. And everybody that said that to me, I'm like, that's what Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries <laughs> is. That's what we do there. We're yeah. all able to talk to each other through the group that you set up on Facebook or through emails to you. You get it out to everybody else, the listserv yes. uh, that came through. It's like And our new website has a, a section for resources. And it will only be as good as the contributing sanctuaries. But sometimes just a little thing like uh, one um, tip in there from a sanctuary is when they ha have all their food put away and all their medicine put away, they take a photograph of it, enlarge it, put it on the inside of the cupboard. Now when they get supplies in, they can put a brand new volunteer in there and say, put everything away, just look at the picture. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so it can be a simple thing like that, um, or it can be a, a really uh, uh, organizational changing tip like the colors of shirts for volunteers that your organization uses. It, I, I have heard from so many uh, groups that visited you when we did a workshop at your place that they've used that. It's revitalized their volunteer program. People have pry. Uh, it's made it a much safer place. So sharing ideas, which you are so generous about doing, is uh, is vital in this field, and and so many are working not only in isolation um, from their peers, but isolation from everyone. Yeah, that's so true. The URL that she's talking about is sanctuaryfederation.org, and this has been Patty Finch, the executive director of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. So thank you so much, Patty. I'll let you get packed so we can leave. <laughs> thank you.